Hello, everyone. My name is Roy Ronan. I'm a fourth year graduate student with Vinit Bafna, working on computational genetics and evolution. And today it is my great pleasure and honor to introduce Dr. Christos Papadimitriou. Um, he's considered one of the most influential uh, computer scientists today, so probably hardly needs introduction, but nevertheless, he's getting one. Um, so, Dr. Papadimitriou started his academic path uh, in Athens Polytechnic. Um, he then went on to receive his master's and a PhD from Princeton University, and then uh, was a member of faculty in a number of relatively obscure and unknown institutions, including Harvard, MIT, Athens Polytechnic, Stanford, and here, where he was the recipient of the first endowed chair position on campus. Um, and then finally, he found a local minima at Berkeley in 96, where he has been ever since. Uh, he's published numerous papers, including uh, many of, which, of which are considered landmark, in uh, theory of algorithms and complexity, optimization, AI, game theory, databases, the internet, and for good measure, evolution. And also he's authored and co-authored five widely used textbooks, uh, and a novel, and a graphic novel. <laughs> so obviously there's much more that can be said, uh, but I imagine he also wants to say a few things. So uh, I'll hand it over to Dr. Papadimitriou. Thank you very much, Ron. Uh, is there uh, the okay, okay, good. Uh, 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 You know, I was thinking that uh, sometimes uh, your dreams come true, uh, but you are not in them. <laughs> so so uh, for, uh, for almost a decade, uh, I was dreaming that the CSC, my, my, my constant dream was uh, uh, the CSC department at UCSD that is uh, like it is today. Okay, so uh, uh, all I want to say is uh, congratulations, you have arrived, happy birthday. <laughs> uh, I, I want to say a few more things, okay, so. Uh, um, so, um, I know it's the last lecture, uh, uh, it's hard to concentrate, that's why instead of presenting an argument or results or, 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 uh, or I'm going to tell you a story. And uh, uh, that's exactly what the doctor ordered, that's exactly what your brain is thirsting for, okay? I mean, the story is, is, uh, is uh, uh, what suits you and, and uh, 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 let's let's your mind rest. Okay, so uh, but it's a good story. It's a it's a story of evolution. Uh, one of the uh, really very important uh, intellectual uh, journeys uh, of uh, the past uh, uh, 200 years. Uh, one thing that uh, when we talk about evolution, immediately we think of Charles Darwin. But the fact is that evolution was essentially commonplace, almost banal at the time of Darwin, okay? There were, evolution was in the, in the, in the European intelligentsia. It was uh, very much a well-accepted fact. Uh, uh, so much that one of the great evolutionary thinkers before Darwin was Darwin's own uh, grandfather, uh, Erasmus Darwin. Uh, another great thinker a couple of generations before Darwin was uh, uh, Jean-Baptiste Lamarck. Uh, the, a French zoologist, probably the greatest uh, natural scientist of his time, uh, who had the terrible fortune to be remembered for his uh, only mistake, okay. namely that uh, uh, acquired traits can be inherited. Uh, also before Darwin, believe it or not, uh, the great grandfather of our field, Charles Babbage, uh, was uh, uh, an evolutionist. And in fact, he did say something, you know, in, in, in the 1820, he wrote something almost uh, identical to this, that God created, you know, he didn't use the word algorithm, but I mean, he did say it. God created not exactly species, but uh, he created the algorithm for creating species, which uh, I guess is a nice try from Charles, right? I mean, <laughs> uh, so, uh, uh, and uh, 
Charles uh, Babbage's, uh, you know, his contribution to this debate is important because, uh, you know, I'm mentioning it because uh, what I want to emphasize a little is uh, how covertly computational ideas had always been present in evolution, okay, in evolutionary thinking. But obviously, uh, the most important uh, thing that happened to evolutionary thought was uh, the publication in 1859 of, uh, of uh, The Origin of Species by Charles Darwin, and uh, longest title I forget. Uh, it, uh, uh, the main contribution of uh, Darwin to uh, the theory of evolution, and basically the contributions which made it into uh, a scientific field, uh, were two. One was common ancestry, the theory, the hypothesis that uh, uh, all life has evolved from uh, a few species, he said, he meant one species. Uh, and uh, most importantly, perhaps, uh, the theory of natural selection, uh, which uh, in some sense it is the work, the workhorse of evolutionary theory. It uh, is the, uh, the basically gave an explanation, uh, provided, provided the uh, mechanism whereby evolution happens. Um, at uh, Berkeley, we teach uh, uh, the origin of species, incidentally. I really hope that you, all of you read it, because uh, there, is no, well, there is no book like it. At Berkeley, we teach it in uh, uh, the uh, Department of Rhetoric, because it is an unparalleled piece of uh, scientific rhetoric. Uh, it, is, uh, it is almost eerie uh, how you open the book, and uh, Darwin, extremely seductively, starts telling you about pets. And uh, sort of, you know, the uh, mid-19th century uh, English uh, uh, educated lady opens the book and says, yeah, that's right. Why I never thought of that? And then tells you about animal, animals in the wild, and so on, and so on, and so on. Okay, so you know, it's, it's, it's an amazing, amazingly compelling argument. Incidentally, Darwin wrote six editions uh, during his lifetime of the book. And uh, in fact, you can find in uh, the web today a true phylogenetic tree of these editions, okay? You know, with, uh, with uh, uh, very interesting annotations of, about the differences, okay? And uh, one of the, of the most studied differences is the number of mentions of the word God, which actually goes up and down. It has a curious harmonic of two. And uh, if you think about it, harmonics of two betray inner conflict, okay, you know, so uh, that interesting uh, footnote. So, um, uh, and then, of course, there, there is the, the, the Wallace Darwin papers, uh, incidentally, even if you don't follow my advice, you know, my admonition, and, and you don't read the, 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 the you know, it, it will, it will, take, a, it will take, take a week, I mean, you know, it's, it's, not, it's not easy reading. There is no excuse why you wouldn't read the, the, the Darwin Wallace papers. You can find them on the web, and there are a total of four pages. Okay, so 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 you know, and, and they are they are uh, uh, amazing, amazingly good read. So I don't know if you know the story, but but uh, Wallace was uh, was another great naturalist at the time at time of Darwin, and in fact he was very different from Darwin. He was he didn't come from uh, from the delegation or the higher class. Uh, he was a kind of Indiana Jones of of, of biology. He would, uh, he would go to Borneo and, uh, and, and uh, Southeast Asia, and then uh, he could come back with crates full of life that he would sell to the British aristocracy and raise money for his next uh, foray into the jungle. Okay? And it turned out that in 1958, 1858 uh, Wallace was uh, burning with fever from malaria, and uh, he woke one morning and uh, had it called uh, natural selection. Uh, he scooped Darwin, okay, you know, so, you know he, he said, yeah, you know, obviously, you know, this, this is how it happens, okay, the, and uh, so uh, 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 what he did is, uh, uh, you know, he was stuck, he was stuck uh, sick in a, in, a, in a faraway place, so he wrote a letter to the naturalist that he admired the most, and this happened to be Charles Darwin. Uh, and uh, it was, uh, you know, I was not there when Darwin opened the letter, but I'm sure he fell off his chair, okay? And, and uh, uh, you know, one of, the, one, of, one of the things that you have to admire to Darwin is that uh, he handled the situation with impeccable uh, integrity. Uh, what he did 
is uh, he convened a meeting of the Royal Society of Biologists, or the Linnean Society, as it was called then. And uh, uh, there, his, uh, the Wallace letter was read, and also a letter that almost contemporaneously uh, Darwin had written to another scientist. And uh, announcing these two letters, announcing the simultaneous discovery of, uh, of the basically the, the force behind evolution. Uh, and, uh, uh, you know, one, you know, as I told you, I'm a little, I'm, a, I'm sort of obsessed with 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 uh, with the tidbits of computational thought that came uh, that, uh, the, uh, in evolutionary thinking, and uh, in this case, uh, if you read Darwin's paper, of the two pages, the first one is about exponential growth. Okay, so the man tries to explain to his to the to the scientific elite of his time what exponential growth is. The thing that if you try to explain to a person in the street now, they're going to interrupt you and say, yeah, yeah, and I know what you mean. You know, go ahead. Uh, you know, you know it, it, takes, it takes one dense page to explain to the great scientists of his office era, okay? And the reason is that they have not, never seen it before. So once he explains that 10 generations is, uh, is 1,000 and 12 generations is a million and, and, so, you know, and, and so on, uh, well, you know, why does he say that? Because the continuous of his, uh, Incidentally, and uh, uh, Darwin had uh, the idea of exponential growth, which was very uh, instrumental in his thinking. Uh, he got from from economist Malthus, okay, you know, which was which was, who also worked in the beginning of the of the 19th century. So, um, uh, what's what's the reason that that Darwin so meticulously uh, defines exponential growth in his letter? And the, the answer is that his full argument is the following. Okay, that's what exponential growth is. It's extremely alien. Nobody has seen it ever. You don't see it in the real world. Why not? Since the law of reproduction uh, predicts that that's how species should behave, the, the population should behave. And the answer is that life is tough and only the fit survive. Okay, yeah, and that's sort of the beginning of his argument. All right. So, uh, uh, was the, it's a brilliant argument. But uh, there are many questions that uh, Darwin did not, did not ask. And uh, two of them are going to be sort of uh, uh, the key points of my, of my, of my talk, uh, of, my, of my argument later. One is what is the role of sex? Uh, Darwin says about half a half, half dozen times, in, in, uh, admits uh, in the origin about half a dozen times that he does not understand sex at all. In other words, he does not understand the place of sex in uh, in, uh, in life, in evolution. And there is a good reason for that. I mean, no, he didn't understand it because he didn't want to understand it, because of the following, that sex, as it was understood in, in, in the 19th century, uh, was uh, going contrary to, to Darwin's argument, okay? It was, it was against Darwin's argument. Here is why. Because, uh, because back then, uh, the, 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 un the, the metaphor for sex was not, uh, two bit strings that get recombined, okay? But the metaphor of sex was, uh, for sex was uh, uh, you mix two liquids, okay? And the point is that if a population keeps mixing liquids, okay, in the beginning, in the end, you get a uniform, uh, nondescript brown, okay? And uh, where is the diversity? Where, where, is, where, is, where is the variation that we see around us in life, okay? That's, you know, it, it's completely lost. And, uh, and uh, you know that's that's the second question that Darwin never 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 quite never quite ask. What is the what is the force that maintains diversity? Okay. After uh, Darwin, probably the second greatest evolutionary thinker of all times is this wise man whose whose name happened to be Augustus Weismann. Okay. So um, uh, and uh, in his inaugural address as as uh, as uh, um, uh, the, the president of the University of Freiburg, uh, uh, he gave a, an amazing one, one, of, one of the greatest papers ever written in biology. Uh, and uh, in this paper, among a, a lot of brilliant arguments, he really says this. You know, you know he didn't, doesn't use the words because the words do not exist, but that's exactly what he says. That uh, the mapping which maps uh, our genes to what we are cannot be back-engineered, okay? 
Therefore, Lamarck was wrong. Okay, because there is no way to lose an arm and uh, this information to find its way back to the gene that, that develops your right arm. Okay, that's, this is sort of the, 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 uh, the implication. So this, still, this is uh, considered the, the death blow to uh, Lamarckianism. Um, all right, then uh, explosive thing happens. Uh, uh, seven years after, after Darwin, uh, Gregor Mendel uh, came up with the laws of genetics. Okay, so you know, and and uh, and uh, uh, incidentally, we are all scientists who are impatient for our work to have impact. So I'm asking you, how many? Uh, citations do you think that this paper which was probably one of the 10 greatest papers in science ever written uh, how many citations do you have in these first 35 years and uh, uh, the answer is uh, three and those who have read these papers tell me that uh, that uh, these three people did not get it okay did not get it. <laughs> um, all right so but uh, uh, 35 years later uh, Mendel's, uh, and also Mendel, incidentally, that's that for the younger scientists, okay, you know, this is uh, it, it's an important part is that Mendel uh, bears a big part of the responsibility because he, he wrote it in an obscure way and published it in an obscure place, okay, so um, this paper, all right, so, so Mendel, Mendel was, uh, you know, was, was to also to blame for this. In any event, uh, uh, Mendelism was discovered was uh, adored, people loved it. I mean, you know, they, they were, you know, immediately reproduced experiments and, and, and were totally impressed. I mean, you know, the, suddenly, the, the, you know, and these seem to be completely at loggerheads with Darwin, okay? Because, because whole, the whole of Darwin's argument was about, uh, was about uh, uh, continuous traits, okay? I mean, you know, he never talked about discrete traits, but Gregor showed us that, uh, Bees have either all white or all yellow flowers. Okay, so you know that the traits are discrete, and they and there are amazingly precise mathematical laws about inheritance. Okay, you know, so what what what, what is happening? Uh, and therefore, uh, evolutionists were split into camps and started fighting. Okay, and uh, this crisis, scientific crisis in the sense of Kuhn, uh, lasted for uh, 20 years, and was uh, was. Uh, the way that this crisis was resolved was essentially the birth of a new science, as always happens. And this new, new, birth of new science was population genetics. And it was uh, basically three mathematicians, three great mathematicians, Fisher, Wright, and Haldane. They uh, created the mathematical theory that reconciled genetics with Darwinism. Okay? In other words, uh, they created a, a, a quantitative theory, which I'm going to, to, whose rudiments I'm going to explain next which uh, essentially says, you know, so one, one way to see why this theory uh, uh, reconciled Darwinism with, Mendel, with Mendel, Mendelism is the following, that uh, uh, continuous traits can be the result of uh, many discrete genes, okay? So that, that's, that's, that's one way of looking at it, okay? So, uh, uh, okay, so let me explain to you what these people did. Uh, First of all, the survival of the fittest. This, you know, Fisher and Wright said that uh, fitness is a number, okay? And uh, a good surrogate for fitness is the expected number of children that an organism is, 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 is going to have, okay? So, so uh, if you are very fit, then you are going to live a long life and be very successful and, 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 and have a lot of children, okay? So what I, what I have here is... Uh, 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 I have an imaginary organism that has two genes. Uh, the number two is, no, is not coincidental. It's because they gave me a two-dimensional screen to project on. Okay, you know, so uh, uh, you have two genes. The rows are alleles of variants of gene A. The columns are alleles of variants of gene B. And the numbers, they are fitness. Okay, the, the, you know, in particular, if... Uh, uh, if, uh, uh, if I have this, G, this allele of gene A and this allele of gene B, I am very fit and I'm going to have uh, about seven children in expectation. All right? Uh, and uh, then, uh, once you have that, what is a population? A population is a distribution over these alleles. And uh, 
Uh, I know you will not probably not be able to see these numbers, but here is the distribution of these alleles. So each, each one of these numbers shows you the probability that a particular uh, in, in, a, in, a, in a population, the frequency that 9% of the, of the individuals in this population have this particular uh, 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 genetic combination, this particular genotype, which happens to be an unfortunate one, okay, a sterile one. Uh, and then you can write a differential equation. How do these numbers change from generation to generation? Take into account that uh, if uh, this genotype made through this genotype, they're going to produce uh, with probability half this, this genotype and probability half this genotype. Okay? I mean, so if you take all this into account, it's, a, it's basically a combinatorial differential equation and tells you that in the next time, uh, this will happen, okay? The things are going to be to advance this way, and so on and so forth, okay? So this is, this is, how, this is how populations change. All right. Uh, and uh, then, of course, that's not all. There are other things, mutations, creation of new species, changes in the environment, often coming from creation of new species, and so on and so forth, okay? So, but this is sort of the, the Fisher-Wright model of population dynamics, for, for population genetics. Cool. Still, after almost 100 years of, uh, of, uh, of uh, seeing evolution through the lens of this, of this uh, wonderful and, and district descriptive quantitative theory, uh, still we have, we, have, uh, we have questions. What is the role of sex? Let me tell you why the role of sex is extremely problematic. You know, it has been called the, 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 uh, the queen of problems in evolution, okay? How is sex, why is sex is justified? Why is sex is, is, is ubiquitous? Incidentally, when I mention sex, I see an awkward smile in the, in the, in, in the faces of most of you, okay? The, this means that you are not biologists, okay? When by biologists hear the word sex, immediately what comes to mind is uh, the mystery of recombination in evolution, okay? You know, so it took me a very long time to become a biologist uh, in this uh, specialized <laughs> uh, All right, so, so here, is, here is why the role of sex is very, is, is very problematic for evolution, okay? Because sex seems to be a terrible idea. Okay, uh, smile all you want. Okay, yeah. So, um, so seems uh, you know really. So let me explain to you why. First of all, it breaks down lucky combinations. Let me explain. Imagine that uh, that uh, that uh, all stars are aligned and a perfect human being is produced. Uh, perfect liver genes, perfect uh, stomach genes, perfect brain genes, perfect bone genes, perfect perfect uh, skin genes. Okay. This person is going to live 200 years and have 100 children, okay? The problem is that all of, he, all of these children are going to be imperfect because this person will never meet another, person, pers another perfect person to, to marry, okay? So to, to procreate with. And uh, so it was a flash in a moment and this great achievement uh, has been lost, okay? Forever, all right? I mean, so this is sort of the tragedy of sex that, 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 that it breaks down, you know, in an asex if this population was asexual and ever got so lucky, uh, this, uh, this, uh, this uh, person would uh, take over the whole, the whole planet, okay? The, 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 uh, all right, the descendants. So, uh, and uh, so here is another argument, all right? I mean, imagine that you are, that you are a, a young woman who had her ch second child, all right? I mean, then you look at these two children and you think to yourself, these two children have between them one copy of my genes. And the other half comes from the O from the couch, okay? So why am I doing this to myself? If I acted, had acted uh, parthenogenetically, I could have had two children that have two copies of my genes. Okay, so I mean, it seems like, uh, like a, a, a completely, a completely self-destructive thing to do, okay? I know what you're thinking, but these children, they will need a second parent, you know. So this is not, you know, this, is, this, is, this, this applies to only one in a million species, okay? So, 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 it, so it can't be the reason why it started, okay? You know, so so the, the, there must be much, much more sound reasons. Okay. And again, how is variation preserved, all right? I mean, no, that's, that's, that's another, that's another uh, very interesting. And above all. The most, you know, the most uh, uh, persistent uh, question one asks when thinking of evolution, are you for real? Do you really believe 
that these crude mechanisms produced all this, what we see around us. Okay, I just had a walk through the UCSD campus, okay. Uh, it, it, no, it's, it's completely, you know, it's, it's very hard to predict, okay? Very hard to believe. And not only that, I mean, no, and, 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 uh, and uh, uh, the point is that uh, uh, the first disbeliever was Darwin himself. Okay, so I tried to find the most disbelieving picture of Darwin, and, uh, you know, and, uh, and uh, he has written that in a letter that I have to admit that to this, this, uh, this day, the idea that I'm proposing that the eye has evolved through natural selection seems completely incredible, okay, you know, very difficult to believe. Uh, there is, a, there is an algorithmic way of, 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 of expressing this disbelief, okay? And the question is, what algorithm could have achieved all this in a mere trillion steps? Trillion steps is, sounds a lot, okay? But you and I know that it's not a lot, okay? Let's not forget, your cell phone has done about a trillion steps since I started speaking. It hasn't accomplished much, okay? <laughs> And a trillion, a trillion generations is what is believed to have, uh, have come between us and, and Eve, sort of, you know, the first uh, single seller. Okay, so uh, uh, what algorithm can achieve this in a trillion steps? Okay, I really don't know. Well, now I know. You know, believe it or not, uh, I have an answer. You know, I'm going to tell you, I'm going to answer this question, okay? You know, I, I, I have... I'm proposing that uh, I know which particular algorithm, which probably I'm sure you have heard before, uh, is the. It's not linear programming, okay? Don't, don't worry. Okay? It's, it's not simplex, right? You know, but but uh, but uh, uh, there is a particular algorithm which I strongly believe, and I have evidence to show, that is precisely the one that that uh, that uh, that uh, uh, brought us all this. Okay, fine. Let me continue. Evolution and CS practice. Okay, so evolution has influenced CS practice, and. This is called genetic algorithms. It's an idea that came 30 years ago from John Holland, but it was embraced uh, enthusiastically by many computer practitioners. And I, I should tell you, sort of, you know, I, I was always a neighbor to this idea, so much that I taught a course when I was at UCSD, okay, sort of, you know, about a few, th a few, a few genres of algorithms, uh, including genetic algorithms. I remember the title of the course was New Age Algorithms, okay, you know, but, uh, but uh, you know, but, uh, in any event, uh, the the point is that uh, that uh, what you know the I think I think most of you know what a genetic algorithm is, but the idea is the following: you have a hard optimization problem to which you are going to find good solutions. Then what you do is you create a population of solutions, and these solutions you encode as genotypes of an organism. Okay, and then they evolve through mutations and sex and procreate with success proportion of the object. In other words, the fitness of this of each organism is precisely how good a solution to the program your problem you are interested in is. Okay, and eventually some very good solutions is the theory are bound to arise in the soup. Okay, uh, and uh, in this corner. You have simulated annealing, which is a completely, you know, also evolutionary algorithm, but of a different style, much simpler, much more parsimonious, and which uh, relies on asexual reproduction. Basically, mutations are adopted with probability increasing with fitness, objective differential. Okay, so the same idea, asexual evolution. And now the mystery of sex deepens. Here is why. Because uh, simulated annealing works fine, and by this I mean the following specific thing, okay? Here is, here is, my, here, here is my, my standards. Uh, I know of several practical important problems for which people have tried a very diverse uh, 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 genres, kinds of algorithms, and simulated annealing came on the top, okay? So you know, people adopted simulated annealing. However, and uh, I lose friends every time I, 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 uh, I press uh, the button for this bullet, uh, genetic algorithms do not work, okay? Uh, here's what I mean, that I'm not aware of a single problem where several approaches have been tried in earnest and genetic algorithms came on top, okay? And 
I will explain. So, you know, in some sense, what I'm going to explain to you next is why this is, okay? So, you know, it, it's, it's very simple, it's very simple scientific, uh, scientific uh, 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 reasoning. But in nature, the opposite happens. See, sex is successful and ubiquitous, okay? You know, it's so ubiquitous. I mean, if you visualize the tree of life, okay? Let's say 100 million leaves. And uh, how many are asexual? There is one here, one here, one here, one here. There are so, there are so few that they are famous and the biologists study them, okay? And once in a while, they catch them in the act and then they say, sorry, it was not asexual, okay? You know, the, the, <laughs> and, uh, and you know, this happened, this, happened, this happened a year ago, okay? You know, with, with, uh, with uh, uh, Deloids, okay? You know, so, you know, one of the most famous asexual organisms, okay? So, and uh, the point, even these asexual, these extremely uh, rare obligate asexual organism, uh, species, they are not descendants of an ancestral uh, uh, asexual species, but they, are, they come from sexual species who lost it. Okay? So sex is extremely powerful. I mean, it's extremely ubiquitous. Okay? So, and and, 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 and uh, how come? How come then nature's favorite trick when you program it on a computer, it falls on, the, on its face. Okay, you know, it's, it's uh, and genetic algorithms don't work. I mean, that, that, that's the question I want to, I want to, I want to propose, to, to, to pose. And uh, here is the answer. Uh, uh, what if sex is a mediocre optimizer? Okay, sex does not, is not very good at optimizing fitness. Okay, that's not its point. What if sex optimizes something else? And what if this something else is it's a raison d'etre, a raison d'etre? And uh, uh, the answer is mixability. With uh, 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 Adil Ivnat and uh, several, uh, several other biologists, so I'm, I'm the only computer scientist with this paper, we show through simulations that natural selection under asex optimizes fitness, as we all knew ex and expected, but under sex it optimizes something else which we call mixability, which is the ability of alleles, gene variants, to perform well with a broad spectrum of other alleles. And let me explain by coming back to this figure. What I'm saying here is that uh, uh, after... What I'm saying is that ASEX will select the largest numbers, okay? And after a while, the whole population will consist of these two and eventually only of this. Whereas sex will select the rows and columns with the largest average. Not the largest, will ignore the largest numbers and select the rows and columns that have the largest averages. Okay? And I have a, I have a asterisk here to remind myself to warn you. Now when I say average, I don't mean add this up and divide by five. I mean weighted average by the frequencies that these allele have in the population. Okay? Okay? And... Uh, Again, our experiments, our simulations show that it's this that, uh, that, uh, that, that sex promotes, not, uh, not, uh, not fitness, okay? Excellent. Uh, I was pretty happy with this result, except that it's not a result of the kind that, that, that I want to prove. You know, it, it's, uh, the question is, can you establish this analytically? And for this, I want to introduce you to a friendly amendment, so to speak, to the, to the Fisher-Wright model that came from uh, another amazing uh, evolutionary thinker, Kimura, uh, in 1970. So Kimura proposed what is called non-neutral theory. Uh, and there is a mathematical interpretation of this called weak selection, which I'm going to explain next. Evolution proceeds not by leaps, leaps upwards, but mostly horizontally through statistical drift. In other words, there are sort of, you know, little victories every day and a few losses once in a while and so on, and therefore, so, you know, life goes on, okay? Some good ideas are lost, some bad ideas get, get fixed, big deal, okay? So, you know, because, because it's horizontal, mostly horizontal anyway. All right, so, uh, and uh, in mathematics, uh, weak sele this expression is weak selection, which means that the fintech landscape is not like this, but it's more like this, okay? In other words, the fitness values are very close to each other. So selection really proceeds mostly horizontally. But it's important, okay, because, because uh, 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 you really want to be not here, but here, okay? So that's, that's, uh, that's, that's the point. Uh, 
Weak selections have, have some consequences. One of, uh, one of them is linkage equilibrium, which really means that the frequency of the genotypes are product distributions, that the, genotype, that the, that the genes are independent. Okay? You can uh, think of them as uh, a soup of alleles. Okay? The population is just a soup of alleles. Uh, uh, some genes with some alleles and the frequency of these alleles, and that describes completely the, 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 the uh, state of the population. And in each generation, and then the mathematics shows that in each generation, the frequency of an allele is multiplied by the allele's average fitness, which essentially means by its mixability. In other words, indeed mixability is what is being optimized here, because, uh, because uh, 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 this is what, this is the amount by which it, uh, the allele's frequency is, uh, is boosted. Okay, that's precisely its mixability. So indeed, it is mixability that marks the success of an allele in the presence of sex. So let me change the subject and for a moment and, and uh, introduce you to a problem. I think that, that most computer scientists in the audience have heard of it. It's called the expert's problem. So it's the following, my, it's the following my, my, uh, mental experiment. Imagine that you have 10 experts, all right? 10 financial experts, and every day, you have to choose one of them and trust him with, 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 their, with your money, okay? And in the end of the day, when, the, when this day is over, this expert, by the way he has, he has manipulated your money, has either won you $1,000 or lost you $1,000 or something in between, okay? So basically, the advice of an expert results in a gain between minus one and one, all right? The challenge is, you want, without knowing the experts, so this happens for a year. In the end of the year, you stop and think, okay, I pick these experts uh, during the 365 days of this year, uh, according to my intuition and, and expectation, and uh, God, how I wish I had picked from the beginning expert number three, because his advice was consistently better and I had not seen it soon enough, okay? So basically your challenge is to do as well, to find an algorithm which is ex post, in retrospect, uh, correct. That it does as well as the be best expert in retrospect, okay? Even though you didn't know. And the amazing thing here is that this can be done. Uh, and uh, it's a hard to believe fact which has been uh, 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 has been, you know, it's so hard to believe that people have discovered it five times and forgotten about it, okay, you know, so, um, so in, in, in economics it's called Hannan consistency because uh, economists called Hannan uh, discovered it in 1958. Uh, Tom Cover uh, uh, discovered it in 1980 in the context of financial uh, economics, uh, mathematics. Uh, it was, uh, it was, it was, it lay at the basis of the Wino algorithm in the, in the 1980s, uh, boosting uh, uh, is, is essentially uh, very, very close to that. In, in game theory, it's called no regret learning. And then theoreticians discovered it, okay, last of all, as always, you know, and, and, we, and we call it uh, multiplicative weights update algorithm. And the amazing, uh, the amazing with this fact is that this algorithm, okay, let, let me explain to you what the algorithm is. You initially assign to all experts the same probability. And then you do the following simple thing. At each step, you reward the ones who did well, and you punish, so to speak, the ones who did badly by multiplying this weight, this frequency, this expectation, this probability which you are going to choose them next, by one plus a small multiplier times the gain or loss they caused you that day. Nothing could be simpler than that. And the amazing fact is, you know, it's amazing for many reasons, okay, including that he has extremely simple proof, okay, uh, that this does as well as the best expert. And here is the reason. Uh, the reason is the following: that uh, sorry, that uh, that this this uh, this uh, this thing here is uh, one plus uh, one plus epsilon. Uh, uh, this thing is essentially e raised to the re, e, the, uh, e raised to the e plus uh, g, uh, e times g uh, power. 
And then the point is that the weight of each expert, after all these days, after 200 days, they're going to be essentially contain in their exponent the sum of uh, what it has uh, lost or gained you, OK? And therefore, if an expert does consistently better, it's one of these common uh, cases in probability theory where you, re where you put something in the exponent and suddenly there is sudden clarity, OK? Uh, and, uh, and, uh, and even expert does consistently better. You will never try anybody else because this expert is going to be immensely bigger, has, is going to have an immensely larger weight than anybody else. OK. All right. So the point is that this algorithm does not just solve the expert's problem, but solves uh, zero-sum games, linear programming, convex programming, cogestion minimization in networks. Okay, it, it solves an amazing array of problems. All right, I mean, so in, it solves problems so sophisticated that it had no right to hope to solve. Okay, and uh, computer scientists, uh, you know, theoreticians, I guess, mean, I mean. Uh, react with disbelief, okay? That is, we find it hard to believe that such a screw technique solves all this sophisticated problem. And of course, I remind you of the other disbelievers, okay? You know, that, uh, and uh, so here is the punchline. Uh, here is something that we can prove. Under weak selection, which basically is Kimura's theory, which is very widely accepted among, among, among evolution theorists, uh, evolution of a species is a game. When I, see, when I say this, I mean the following that the Fisher-Wright equations, which have been, uh, have, have been uh, for 100 years a standard way of understanding evolution, in, those, in the regime of weak selection, these same equations, you can reinterpret them as the equations governing the play of a particular game. Okay? So let me describe the game. It's a game between players, uh, and the players are the genes. Okay? So it, it's a game between genes. And I know what this brings to your mind. It brings you to your mind the selfish gene by Dawkins, okay? You know, no, that's not it, okay? The, these are, this is not the selfish gene. These are the community-minded gene. I'll explain why. The strategy of the gene, every play, every gene has, uh, has many strategies. These strategies are the alleles of these genes, the vari various variants of this gene. And then the common utility, because there is a common utility, all these players have a common goal. This is a strange game. There is no conflict here, okay? Everybody wants to op maximize the same thing, okay? And it's the fitness of the organism. It's a coordination game. Such games are extremely boring. No, you know, game theorists don't study them. And the, question, the reason is that they don't present, they represent conflict. But for us, they're interesting games. For computer si in computer science, they're studied a lot. They're interesting games because they are... Uh, uh, they are uh, become interesting when the players are cognitively challenged. When, when, when they don't know the game, they don't know where they're going, they're not, they don't know what to do. And, of course, genes are cognitively challenged. Okay? So, so it's, it's, it's very appropriate for, for this context. So it's a coordination game where the common utility coincides with the interest of the organism. And uh, the probabilities, so as we know, in games, players randomize. So the genes will randomize. With what probabilities do they randomize among their alleles? With the probabilities that are, in, that are implicit in the frequencies in the population. And uh, here comes the punchline. The game is played through the multiplicative updates algorithm. Okay, so uh, this is the algorithm okay, that, that I, was, I, was, I, was, uh, I was alluding before. All right? This is the algorithm that brought us all this. Uh, that's uh, that's uh, re very recent work with... Uh, uh, Eric Chastain of Rutgers, Adil Livnat of Virginia Tech, uh, Adil Livnat and Eric Chastain are, are, are biologists, and my colleague Gumesh Vazirani at Berkeley. Uh, so, this, uh, so in some sense, what I'm saying is that this theorem unites two mysteries, okay? If you think about it, Theoreticians are uh, not very good at solving mysteries, but are good at uniting mysteries, okay? For example, Karp's paper in 1972 about empty-completeness united 21 mysteries, okay? You know, into the concept of empty-completeness, right? You know, so that's just, just one, one uh, uh, methodological self-sarcasm, okay? Uh, so uh, uh, here is, here is another, th another thing that comes out of this. If you look at the multiplicative weights update under the microscope, okay, it 
has a, you know, and basically you ask the strange question, okay, suppose it was a, uh, a, uh, a, uh, 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 how do you call it, a, 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 uh, a steepest descent, uh, algo a, a, a gradient descent algorithm for, uh, for, uh, solving, uh, for solving some convex optimization problem. Which convex optimization problem would it be, okay? And it turns out that it's optimizing a combination of performance plus entropy. Okay, so it tries to do well, but without losing, losing variation, preserve, without, by preserving variation. Therefore, as a result, this shows that, this sort of explains why uh, uh, variation is preserved so well in, in evolution. And, uh, uh, and to my mind, this is the role of sexual evolution, to enable the multiplicative weights update algorithm, which would be completely possible without sex. All right. Uh, incidentally, uh, this, all the, all, all, all what I'm saying here is about evolution in the small, okay? So, you know, it's, you know, evolution between mutations, okay? You have heard uh, talks about evolution before, and probably they focused on mutations. Mutations are important. Mutations are paramount, okay? Because they create the diversity explored by the multiplicative weight updates algorithm, okay? But without a tool to work well between mutations, okay? Mutations would be meaningless, all right? So that's, uh, okay. Uh, in conclusion, the study of life, you know, so, so I, I have been blessed uh, all these years, uh, both at UCSD and elsewhere, with working with uh, amazing people on amazing problems, but uh, I cannot describe to you the fascination that, that, uh, that I'm feeling when, when, I, when I work on this one. Uh, and, uh, it's also very gratifying that uh, insi uh, insights about computation uh, turn out to be uh, right on the mark. Uh, and uh, we have uh, made uh, progress in understanding uh, the mystery of sex and the mystery of variation. And uh, that's all. Thank you. Yeah. In what cases in computer science would they, would they Yeah, be excellent there? question, excellent question, thanks. So uh, to repeat the question, uh, Joav is asking, uh, you know, what, uh, you know, under what circumstances would, would, uh, would genetic algorithms be good? So, so, I, so let me tell you first something else, okay? I mean, you know, there is, there is a very easy reason, a very, very easy way to explain why genetic algorithms, why Holland was wrong, okay? Holland was wrong because of the following, because, the, because you know, he equated evolution with uh, heuristics, okay? There is a huge difference, and this huge difference uh, is, is, is devastating for this analogy, okay? The huge difference is the following, that in heuristics, you strive to create a population which contains some outstanding individuals. This is, this is your goal. In evolution, you create good populations. Huge difference, okay? So, is, uh, is, uh, is our genetic algorithms useful? I believe so, okay? And uh, I would use them in uh, cases where the objective function is either fuzzy or not well understood or multi-objective or uh, time-varying, okay? Uh, and uh, and for, the, for such, for such, uh, for such, you know, if I want to do robust optimization, if you wish, okay? Uh, you know, good for many objective functions. And, uh, and, uh, I believe that, that, that there might be some, some cases where this would be valuable, that would be valuable. Uh, so, uh, so the question is, what happens when you know? I, I have assumed I showed you this matrix, and this matrix is constant. Okay, I mean, what happens if? Uh, uh, so, uh, uh, what do I want to say here? 
definitely, as I said, okay, sort of the mutations are important. Uh, environmental shifts are extremely important, okay? So, you know, they, they, they do punctuate evolution, sort of, you know, as a, uh, But the point is, so, what is, what is my game here, okay? I mean, you know, I, I, I try to give you a few rigorous facts, okay? Uh, if I, using models that were quite accepted, okay? Uh, biologists uh, like to savage people who, 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 uh, uh, who enter the realm, okay? You know, so, so they have a harder, uh, harder time savaging me because I tell them these are, these are the equations that we have been believing for 400 years, and this is what these equations tell you, okay? If I said, here is a model of how the environment changes, and here is why it supports what I'm saying, I would be open to uh, all kinds of attacks. Okay? So you know, so you understand what I'm saying. I mean, you know, so so yeah, I I am working on on changing environment. Okay, and now I am working on mutations. So I hope I hope you all heard you all, you all heard the, the question. So uh, um, I appreciate your point of view. Uh, I completely disagree. Uh, uh, so uh, uh, I uh, so why? Because because uh, uh, I told you mutations are paramount. Okay, so you know it's it's okay. It's not it's not it's not a theoretician trying to oversimplify the problem. Okay. It's a theoretician trying to show that there are amazing forces that we had not seen before for 100 years, okay, at work. All right, so you said sort of, you know, recognize the good mutation. The mutation is going to be a column of this, of this table, all right? How it's generated, nobody knows, all right? So, so uh, the point is that you will need multiplicative weight updates in order to incorporate this column and do, okay, you know, so th th this is what the mutation is going to be. And then, of course, other things will happen, okay, so, you know, there, there is going to, the, you know, the, the numbers will change, all right, I mean, and, but all I'm saying is that between these tectonic changes, there is a, a very powerful silence, silent force at work, okay, that we have not observed before. Okay, okay, okay. Okay, let's thank Dr. Papadimitri one last time.